Oh, there's a picture of Ron, looks better in person even than on the photo. No beard tonight, so a little younger looking. And we're so glad that he's here. Ron uh, didn't get to speak uh, as part of the series last summer, but you recall this is our fourth summer, fourth summer, yeah, fourth summer to do this. And Ron actually kicked us off the, the first two summers. So we're glad he's here tonight. He's asked us to read a passage. We're going to do it together from Ephesians chapter 2. This is his text for his message tonight. And we'll do this congregationally. So as you're accustomed to from time to time, we do this in our Sunday gatherings. Uh, I'll read the parts that are labeled leader. If you would read the parts that are labeled people. And we'll read these 10 verses. And then we'll have a prayer together. And then we'll invite Ron to the podium um, to speak to us tonight. <clears throat> As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It is by grace that you have been saved. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And let's pray together. Let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful to be a part of your family. We're grateful for this opportunity to be here this evening as, as friends, as neighbors, as brothers and sisters, fellow disciples of Jesus, who come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different walks of life. And uh, yet at the same time, Father, we have so much in common. We are made in your image. We have fallen, Father. We have gotten caught up in sin, just as this passage talks about. And Father, that is the truth, the reality of our existence as humans, created by you, for you, and yet deceived by Satan and corrupted by sin. And so Father, we are grateful for the fact, uh, the truth, the promise, the hope this passage offers that we have been saved, we've been redeemed, we've been rescued by Jesus to do those things that you created a long time ago for us to do. And Father, we ask that you would bless our brother Ron tonight as he shares with us from your word, uh, that we might be challenged and encouraged, that we might be lifted up, that we might be transformed by the truth of your word, by your Holy Spirit, who is at work within us. Father, pour the gift of teaching through our brother Ron as he shares with us. Thank you for him. Thank you for Jane. Thank you for his mom who's with us tonight. Bless them in a mighty way. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Hey, good evening, guys. You may not know the history of the most expensive painting that was found, restored, and then auctioned off. But I want to share a brief history with you on that tonight as we proceed. The passage I'll be giving, let's see here, is that all? 
Okay. The passage I've been given to start off the summer series is Ephesians 2, really basically verse 10 is the primary verse. Thank you so much for reading it for me. I, I really appreciate your public reading of the word. I want to give just a, a brief history of this painting, and I'll, I'll trust that we're moving forward on it here. Okay. So this dilapidated photo over here, this first dilapidated photo, it was taken somewhere around... 1908. 1908 this photo was taken and they thought it was a cheap copy of an old master attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. But in 1908 they just thought it was a piece of junk. Well it sat as a piece of junk, untouched up, not taken care of for four more decades. And then in 1958, as you can see up here, it sold for $62.50, which in my thinking is $63 too much, I think, right? I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Well, not too much longer, this unappealing, this dark and unappealing painting, completely undeserving of hanging in any outhouse wall, let alone somebody's house, was purchased for just under $10,000 at an auction in New Orleans by a group of art dealers. Why, you might ask? They suspected, they believed, that this was an old masterpiece that had been painted over. That it was a masterpiece by Leonardo da Vinci, first painted in 1500, 500 years earlier. The group acquired the picture and then they hand it over to a woman named Diane Dwyer Modestini, and she is a famous New York City art restorationist. She's particularly known for her ability to restore paintings. So over several years, I think ultimately it was uh, maybe close to six years total on the restorations, she began to do restorations. <laughs> and this is what it looked like when they got some of the overpainting off of it. You gonna buy that? Anybody want that in their house? I I, I don't I, I don't think so. However, after its restoration, it's a little hard to see here, but she's restored it. You can see the uh, let's see we got a, a yeah, there we go. There's this glow that's just crystal clear. I don't know if these lights are lighting it up. I can't tell. And then the curls, the curls and the hair are phenomenal. After she restored it, in 2013, it sold for $75 million. Later the same year, it sold for over $127 million. And then in 2017, this photograph that, I mean, this painting that truly looked like a starving artist did it, and it could have been uh, sold at Kirkland's on sale, right? sold as the most expensive painting ever at auction. Christie's Auction House sold it for $450.3 million. Currently, this masterpiece is in the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which is in the United Arab Emirates, in case you want to go see it. 19 inches by 26 inches. 450.3 million dollars. Thank you. Tonight what I want to do is I want to share with you a masterpiece that was infinitely in, in infinitely worse condition, cost infinitely more to restore, and is so priceless and beloved the owner of the cosmos would never auction off any one of us. That's who we are. That's what the passage says, poema, right? We are his poem, his masterpiece, his work of art. This priceless story is found primarily in verse 10 of chapter 2, but we've already looked at and read the context. So I want to give a, a disclaimer, and then I want to teach a little bit, and then I'm going to preach at the end. Does that work for you guys? Now, you've got to realize, I, I, like, I can't move around too much. So this is, this is being in lockdown is tough for me right now, because I already want to be like down there and over there, but I want to... I'm going to stay in my cage right here. So just, just know that. When it comes to adult Bible classes, I think often familiarity breeds content. 
I mean that like I mean it. Here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we become so familiar with the Bible passage that we already know in advance the content that's going to be discussed that day. This is very true of Ephesians 2, 8, 10. Because we come to that, you're saved by grace, through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. We are as workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God is beforehand prepared that we should walk in them. And we already know, we're going to talk about, we're going to define grace, we're going to define faith, we're going to talk about where do works fit in, and if you're a good church Christ person, you're going to try to figure out how you can talk about Baptism. Somebody knows it. There's a man in the choir right there, right? I, I don't I don't make fun of that because those aren't important subjects. But I think so often familiarity breeds content. And we can miss the core idea of the passage because we're so used to discussing the ancillary ideas of the passage. And tonight I want to come back to the core idea of this passage. And so I need to just do a little teaching with you like I would do at school, at Trinity Christian School. And I want to show you a few things here uh, on these slides. So a couple things I want you to, here's the whole passage together so you can see its intertextuality. So a couple things I want you to notice. In this passage, every man in this passage, whether dead in sin or alive by grace, is walking and working. I know that it's not very profound, but that's significant. Because I think we tend to think of this passage as a process passage. Like people are dead, and then there's a process, and then they get alive. I get that. that, that that's partially true. But it's also a contrast passage. It's talking about people who are working and walking toward damnation. And people who are walking and working towards glorification. It's not just a process passage. It's a contrast and comparison passage. I want to make sure you see that. The second thing is, most people in the world are walking in darkness and decay. Most people are doing that, right? And they're working for the prince of the power of the air, the devil. But God's provided another way in this passage for us to work and for us to walk. And in a minute, we're going to see what that way is. Here's the third thing I want to add by by way of general introduction to the passage. Everyone in this passage is serving an authority in the spiritual realms. Now, now you got to pause a second so that if, I, if I've lost you, I need you to catch up with me. Some of us have this idea, I don't want to serve God. I don't want to, I don't want a master. I don't, I don't want a king. I don't want a prince. I don't want to Everybody's got a prince. Everybody's got a ruler. I want you to not make another mistake. Well, you know, people outside of God live in the physical realm. Yeah, they think they do. But they got a prince in the spiritual realm. They got a puppet master who's pulling the strings on them. We've got to digest that. There is no in between. Everybody is currently in this room and everywhere in Newton is currently serving somebody who has a claim or makes a false claim to authority in the spiritual realms. Period. You can see it up there, right? We have the prince of the power of the air. He's boss of some of us. We got the one who's been raised. He raises up with him to seat us in the heavenly realms. But this passage stresses that everybody is under the governorship of a ruler in the spiritual realms. That's all of you. That's me. Here's the next thing I want you to see, number four. One of these guys, one of these rulers, is a tyrannical prince. The goal is to dehumanize us, to make us animalistic, to rob us of the image of God and cause us to live in the world in such a way that we no longer have dignity, we no longer have glory. So look at the words and the terms here. Look at, I, I tried to highlight it for you. Dead, trespass, sin, disobedience, lust, flesh, indulgence of slung about my desire ultimately a child of the upcoming wrath anybody want that lifestyle by contrast we have a benevolent God who operates generously he operates generously a generous love graciously makes every effort 
to rehumanize us, to bring us back to the original created dignity that verse 10 talks about. The original, Genesis 1, dignity before uh, Eve messed it up wrong. <laughs> Uh, the show for this lap, right? Where's the ladies at? Come on, you're kidding, right? I mean, think about it. We've been dehumanized ever since. One of the things I say at Jones I want to make sure I make clear here. When you downgrade God, you degrade men. Because we're made in his image. If God gets a downgrade, you get a degrade. And that's what we learn here. That's what we see in these early verses of this passage. I want to share one other thing with you. So one's dehumanizing. The other is trying to rehumanize us. And let me see. I don't know where the... Why can't I get the next one to go here? There we go. All right. And then verse 10, our key verse. So what we see here is where his workmanship, right? His poem, his poem, his artwork. And we're created. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. So notice this. The rehumanization effort is doing something very specific in, in the book of Ephesians. God is trying to make new men, that's verses 1 through 10, to be part of a new community, chapter uh, 2, 11 through 22. We're not talking about that tonight. So that the church, chapter 3, we're not talking about tonight, can be a new missional enterprise for a new creation to come. That's the book of Ephesians, if you wanted to simplify it. That's the gist of Ephesians. So what we want to do is, I just want to, like a sermon, I guess, kind of go through the three main movements of this passage, but I want to focus on the third movement uh, most of all. So let's just start with the obvious stuff. First of all, verses 1 through 3, we have godless works within us before we know Christ. Our BC life. Our BC life, our before Christ life, we have godless works within us. The Bible talks about that we're under sin's corruption, essentially. So I really think Paul, he could have summarized verses 1 through 3 by quoting the most famous line in The Sixth Sense, the movie The Sixth Sense. I see dead people. But notice these dead people in verses 1 through 3 are the most vigorously active people you're going to have a fine. They're not inactive dead people. They're walking and working dead people. They're destroying the world that God made. They're undermining the goal that God had for Adam and his offspring. They're spitting in the face of God as they nail his hands and trees to a, a hands and feet to a tree. They are imminently active. They are walking and working. And I think that's important. I've been there, you've been there. Something else I want to mention about this. The thing about death permeating these first three verses to me is highly significant. Because when you go to the beginning of the Bible, chapter 1 of Genesis, let's just go right to the first page. We often, we do the same thing there. Remember I said familiarity breeds what? Content, right? We're going to argue about evolution, creation, age of the earth, gap theory. But the interesting thing is, if we just throw all that out of the way for a little while and just read it, what we learn about Genesis 1 is that God made things good and they multiplied in the water, in the air and on the land to give him glory. And then as they were multiplying, he made one unique couple, the only one made in his image, to have dominion over the glorious multiplication. It's Genesis 1. Something's gone wrong between Genesis 1 and Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Because now God's glory is not being multiplied. God's image is not being honored. Death, decay, disease, corruption, and damnation are on the horizon. It was not in God's original plan because there were godless 
works within us. Here's another line. I know sometimes we, we come in and out of those uh, sermons. I get I do too. Come in and out of my own, so it's okay. So focus again. Listen to this for me because it's, it's nuanced very specifically. And you can have the notes and give them anybody that wants them, right? Listen about the wicked life. The wicked life is not so much a life that ends in death. It's a lifestyle of death that ends in damnation. Got to hear it one more time. The wicked life, the anti-God life, is not so much a life that ends in death as much as it is a lifestyle of death and decay that ends in damnation. That's the point of the first three verses. And we have to digest that. That is, to me, powerfully significant. So we see we're under sin's corruption. You can, you can read. I don't need to read for you. We're under Satan's dominion, which I think is significant here. Uh, one of the things to think about disobedience. Um, we talk about faith like it's the opposite of disobedience. And in some passages it is. But I want you to think about disobedience a different way. Disobedience is faith in the wrong master. This passage is contrasting the walking dead and the walking living. Those defying God and those following God. And it's also contrasting those who have faith in a system that is not God's. Disobedience. And faith in a God who has the only system that leads to life. That's how this section begins. And I think it's significant. One other just side note I want to make here. If you were a Jew when you read this section, a, a Jew, a, a converted Jew in Ephesus, you would be extremely offended at the first three verses. We don't feel that offense as, as Gentiles. But remember, halakha, the, the Hebrew word halakha for walking, is the fundamental thing that a Jew does. They walk in the Torah. They walk according to godly instruction. The word walking here is not connected to Torah living, it's connected to Torah undermining. And it all has to do with death. We know that they weren't even able to touch a sepulcher, let alone be a cadaver. So, so th there's this double nuance here. This, they, they would feel doubly insulted or frustrated that anybody would be walking Alakai in death. It's meant to shock. It doesn't shock us like it should have, like it would have shocked them. I want to make sure that you do that. So, what do we see? We see the diagnosis. We see dead, deceived, depraved, doomed. This is the diagnosis, really, of everybody. And we know this story is awesome because we are ready to get to the next section, right? So, let's get to the next section here. Let's see. I think I went twice there. There we go. So, the second thing we learn is this. God's work for us, right? We're restored, and you'll see that in the verses uh, that, that are on the board right now. So I want you to note one thing that I want to get out of the way. We're not going to focus on this tonight, but you are one of God's core, core interests. You're not his ultimate goal, but you're one of his core interests. The verses in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 are, to me, fascinating from a literary standpoint. I'm married to an English teacher, so I'm trying to get bonus points with her right now. So here's what's cool about it. Five verses, and the verb does not show up till the first word in verse five. But the person the verb is for is the first word in verse one. He says, and you who are dead and trespassing, blah, 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 but God made them alive. That's powerful because he says, I gotta get to you first. I gotta describe you. Things are not so good. Your life is precarious. You're on the downward trend. But you matter to me. I'm gonna mention you first. And then once you realize there's absolutely nothing you could do on your own, I'm gonna mention me. Because you matter to me. You matter to me. And so God invested in his people. So there's a core concern there. And I think it's me. And I think it's you. And then there's this decisive action. 
I mean, we already know this. God alone brings forgiveness, right? God alone can redeem men. Only God can take gracious intervention. Only heaven can have its divine, sovereign, inbreaking into this cemetery and transform it. Only God can do those things. But we need to understand some of our images of, of sinners and death. At least in this passage, salvation is not a spiritually sick man needing medicine. In this passage, it's not a matter of a drowning man flailing in water and he just has to grab the life ring. But we often think of salvation like that. This passage is very clear. The sinner is a bloated corpse floating face down in a dank, stinky, decaying river of rottenness. And only God can bring life to someone like that. The passage is so very critical. The good news is, though, God can raise bloated carcasses. And I am evidence of one. The late Rabbi Zacharias, I think, was very clear on this. He just passed this last week. He said, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And that's what we see in this section on Ephesians. So I, let me, again, you can read. So let me just summarize it for you pretty quickly. You, you see here, you've got, he redeems us through his great love. You can see the verses. It argues for it. Uh, he's resurrected us by his awesome power. Only God can do that. And then we see 30 elevated us to display his amazing grace. We're, we're trophies of how good God is. And I think that's, that's awesome. God's heart, it longs for those who don't long for him. And so verses 4 through 7 are, are stunning to me. This adversative, this word but, this adversative, it's got to be the most powerful adversative, maybe here in the book of Romans, of anywhere in the Bible. This unbelievable, miraculous reversal that only could be a God thing. God seeks the highest good for those who have now proven there is no good in them at all. Rome, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. So let's set our denominational differences aside. Let's set our arguments about works and grace and faith aside for a second. Because I know one thing all of us can universally say in light of Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies parchment made? If every stalk on earth was a quill, and every man was a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above, would drain the ocean dry? Or could the scroll contain the whole of the stretch from sea to the sky? But tonight I want to get to this third section and get your series ready for the song. I want to share particularly the interesting things in verse 10. I'm like, you can see on the board, I want to start with this first one here. It is a globally purposeful event that God did. So you guys can uh, repeat after me. I don't know if this works. We, we gave it a shot at the reading. We'll give it another shot. I want you to say, God's goal is greater than me. Ready? God's okay. God's goal is greater than me. This passage is a globally purposeful event. I need you to understand something. God's goal was not to save you. You, you got to let that sit in for a minute. God's goal was not to save you. God saved you to get to his goal. Those are very different things. God's goal was not to save you from your sins. He saved you from your sins to get to his goal. This is what your summer's going to be about. Not only is salvation not done by you, 
It's not primarily about you. And in church, we need to return to this more centered biblical understanding of how salvation works and what it's for. We've been saved. We've been saved by God to bring God's glory to the world. That, that's his ultimate thing. So I have a, I guess it's a beef. I try not to make it a beef. I try to be genteel and loving and all that stuff, but it, it does frustrate me. I hear the phrase over and over again. I know what we mean by it. Make Jesus Christ your personal Savior. Hey, it's true. I, I get it. I, I get that everybody's got I, I get that. But here's my beef with it. We've overly personalized what God meant to be globalized. We've overly personalized what God meant to be globalized. What we've done is we've personalized Jesus, then privatized our faith when God's glory was to be advertised in everything that we did. That's who we have to be. That's who we have to become. So, let Christ be your personal Savior. I'm saying yes. But global mission for Christ, yes, yes, yes. That's the goal that God has in saving us. So I'm going to give you like a simple question. When I first asked it to myself, it's one of those moments, I don't know if you have these moments, Alan, but I'm like, why have I never thought of that before? <laughs> it's like right there. But here it is. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Was God's primary goal to save people from Ephesus or to save Ephesus? Is God's primary goal to save you from Noonan or to save Noonan? Was God's goal to get Christians out of the world in which they lived or to get Christ into the world in which they lived? You know it's the latter. God came to save Ephesus. God came to save Noonan. God didn't come to take you out of your life. God came to bring Christ into your life. He's not asking you to change everything. He's just asking you to make Christ Lord of everything. Those are very, very different things. God's goal was not to save you. He saved you to get to his goal. So I'm going to give you some contextual things. Okay? Here's the first one. The immediate context makes what I just said clear. The immediate context. Notice that the paragraph begins with working and walking. And it ends with working and walking. The first guys are working and walking because they have faith in the wrong God. And they bring damnation to the world. They pervert what God's created. The second group are working and walking for the glory of God because Christ came back to recreate and reclaim his people. So the immediate context basically argues this. God wants right walking in a wrong walking world. But he still wants walking. And he still wants working. And I think that's important. God wants to build a worldwide sanctuary over the global cemetery we call Earth. That's his goal. His goal is not just to have a house of worship on 34th Street. His goal is for Noonan to be a sanctuary. God's goal is to build a worldwide sanctuary over the global cemetery we call Earth. The larger context also argues for what I'm saying. Not just the immediate context, but the larger context. So. If, if our mission is to work in a cemetery and join this resurrection life business, which is what I think, notice chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1 moves into the next idea, or the next movement in Ephesians. But it starts out this way. I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. I wonder what he's referring back to. What life? The life that chapter 2, verse 8 through 10 talks about. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 list what he means. What does a resurrected man look like as a new creature 
working in a new creation for the glory of God. It's not super complicated. In chapter 4, 1 to 6, practice unity in your church. Get along with people. Chapter 4, 7 to 16, use your gifts to serve your church. Chapter 4, 17 to 19, continue to remove the former corruptions. Continue to not be dragged back to your former stupidity. 420, intentionally put on your new created self. Stop lying, tell the truth. Stop stealing, go to work so you have to give. Then listen to all this walk. Remember I told you about halakha earlier? There's going to be a quiz later. Halakha? Halakha is the Jewish Hebrew word for what? Walking. Paul, good Jewish man. He uses it a lot in Ephesians. He says, 5, 1, 2, walk in love. He says, 5, 3, 7, walk in purity. He says, 5, 8 to 14, walk in life. He says, 5, 15 to 20, walk in wisdom. Then he talks to husbands and wives. He says, yeah, you're all resurrected too. Walk in submission to one another. He talks to children. Walk in obedience to your parents, chapter 6, 1 through 4, or 3. He talks to dads. He says, don't walk as an authoritarian. Walk as a humble servant for your son and daughter. He talks to employers and employees. He tells them to walk in mutual submission. If they work in the world for the glory of God, get along, stop abusing your rights and your power. And then we come to that famous passage that everybody knows, but we divorced it from the book of Ephesians. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Where? In the heavenly realms. What did I tell you about everybody in this room? Everybody in this room has a mask to wear. In the heavenly realms. This put on the whole order of God passage is not a new subject. It's what he's been talking about since chapter 4, verse 1. We make war with darkness because we're building a sanctuary in our day-to-day -day lives where there formerly was a cemetery. That's Ephesians. That's a good Jewish man for you writing about Holocaust. He puts it all together for us in that. So the immediate context, the general context. Second of all, it's a creational event. Not only is it a globally purposeful event, but it's also a creational event. So far, God's spoken in this passage about salvation as a resurrection. He's talked about salvation as liberation from slavery. He's talked about it as rescue from condemnation. But in this passage, he talks about it as a creation event. And again, I want you to like, like pump the brakes for a second in your mind, slow down. What does that mean when somebody gets, where's your baptistry out here? I thought it was over here. Oh yeah, that's right, you're out there. Did it used to be out here? That's right, I've been in the foyer. You got that, yeah, that's right, it's a good place out there. All right, so think about it. When somebody comes out of that baptistry because they've been saved by grace through faith, period. The Bible describes it as a creation moment. That means when God took Adama, he ruled for dust, and made Adam, that's where he gets his name. We all, we all knew, ladies, that men are just dirt. We knew that. Adama, Adam. And God did CPR on him. God pictures himself as intimately pressing his lips and his power and his intimacy against a clay pot. And he breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living being. Genesis 2-7. We can put Genesis 2-7 back up in the baptistry too because that's a creational moment that is deeply profound and significant. God equates your redemption with the time when earthly dust received heavenly breath for the first time. I am so thankful. You are a new Adam. That's why I'm bringing this up. He doesn't mention creation for no reason. It's like, it's kind of like you can hit the reset button. Don't you want to just start all over again? He says you can. He says you can start all over again. You're a new creation. You're a new Adam. 
I've given you breath when you had none. I've given you life when you were dead. So get busy chop, chopping the in the garden. He's got a lot of work to do, man. It's been in disrepair for a while. Step into it and work on it. Here's the third thing. It's not only a, a, a globally significant event, creational event, but it's an occupational event. So I'm going to just ask you to repeat after me. I am a new worker. So uh, here we go. I am a new worker. All right. So a lot of times, remember I told you familiarity reads content. A lot of times in this past we have arguments over works and not works and all that stuff. So I'm just going to be very honest with you. Uh, the arguments that we have about works and salvation are baffling to me. They're just baffling. Salvation is all about works. Let me show you what I mean. God worked for me. God worked on me. God worked in me. And now God works through me. Period. That's it. We, we don't have to relitigate. We should all know we can't save ourselves because we already learned we're bloating carcasses floating down the river. Let's just, we got that one. God is constantly working through us. His goal was not to save you. He saved you to get to his goal, which is to work through our day-to-day -day lives. It's also a missional event. Now, I do want to do just a hair teaching. You may have not heard this before. I don't know. I, I probably should ask Alan when that was in the day. I have a little bit different understanding of what it be, make, means to be made in the image of God. I'm going to share that with you. You can obviously get discarded if you want to, but it's right, so I suggest you come back to that. We often debate about what does it mean to be made, made in the image of God. But in Semitic thought, we, we, we can't, so we're so, we want to be Westerners who go back to what Moses wrote, and we want to put our idea of humanity on what he wrote. That's a mistake. What did the writers at the time and the theologians at the time think that that meant? This is super significant. In the ancient world, when a king would conquer a new territory, the first thing they would do is they would set up an icon of their god, or if they thought they were a god, of the king, of the king himself in the new territory. They didn't worship the statue. That's kind of a, the wrong idea. The statue was the image of their presence. It meant that this king or this god has now claimed the next territory. If you were the god of Noonan and you conquered Fayette County, you would put an image of yourself in Fayette County so everybody knew that the king of Noonan was also the king of Fayette County. This is pervasive in the ancient literature. This is how it worked. So when God made a kingdom, and then he said, let us make man in our image, he's saying something very specific. He's saying, let them be fruitful and multiply. That's not a population strategy. He's not saying, oh, Adam, you're so lonely, we gotta get you a woman, and, and we gotta get some kids. No, it's a multiplication of image bearers strategy. Adam's in the image of God. Eve's in the image of God. Their children will be in the image of God. And they're going to grow and flourish and they'll leave father and mother and establish a new house and establish a new house and establish a new house until the whole earth is a garden of Eden. Until the whole earth is a temple to the glory of God. A testimony that he multiplied in the water, he multiplied in the air, he multiplied in the land, and he multiplied his image everywhere. That's what that's about. But Adam messed it up. Christ came back to restore that. And guess where? You may not make this connection, but after the night, I hope you always make it. Where did we learn the multiplication connection for the church? Go into all the world. Make disciples of every creature. We were told to do the exact same thing. We were told to multiply and bring people to the recreation, the rehumanization in Jesus Christ. It was a global strategy for holy space. And I know this for a couple reasons. In 1 Timothy, uh, 1, uh, Timothy chapter 6, he calls every one of you here a temple. 
He calls the church in 1 Corinthians 3, the group, the group of, of the community, also a temple. He calls Jews and Gentiles in Ephesians 2 a temple built on foundations. The goal is to make a global sanctuary over the place there was a worldwide cemetery. That's the goal. And that's how God does these things. So, we've gotten people to the baptistry, but we've forgotten to point them to God's artistry. I think it's, I think I mean, when people get baptized, we should celebrate. That, that, we should count numbers. Numbers represent people. Let's stop saying numbers don't matter. Numbers matter. Because numbers are image bearers. And when somebody gets baptized, we should celebrate because, man, heaven, heaven bankrupts, you know, they, they bankrupt the, the bank and they spend it all when somebody comes to Jesus. But let's not bring people to the baptistry without also leading them into the artistry that God has for them. God's goal was not to save them. God saved them to get to his goal for them. And Noonan's goal can't be to save people. God, Noonan's got to help God save people to get them to the goal that God has for their life. And that's mission. That's ministry. In this room, I, I, hope, I, I know here you have a really high percentage of ministry. I know that because I've known that historically. Lots of you do lots of things. I, I, I applaud you for that. That's rare. But none of you should be without mission and ministry. We've recovered the priesthood of all believers in the Church of Christ. But I don't know that we've recovered the ministry of all believers in the Church of Christ. Because ultimately that's why you were saved. To be on mission and minister. So I want to share just a couple quite simple things and then we'll be done. You've done so well. I didn't have to put anybody in timeout or write a reference form to the principles of good. <laughs> It's a quite simple event. I'm to make God known everywhere, all the time. So I made like a slogan. I tried to think the simplest way to do it, and I'm simple-minded, so here's what I came up with. The goal of God is to create a people of God, living out the heart of God, in the world of God, for the glory of God. Now, I don't know if that could be your slogan for the summer, but I do think that's, that's the gist of what this summer it, it, it is and, and it ought to be about. Now think about it. God has shaped our backgrounds. He designed our personalities, informed our dreams. He shaped our dispositions. God doesn't blame who we are on somebody else. He owns who we are. He's not ashamed of who we are. He came back to redeem who we could be. God doesn't blame another God or another master or another maker for who we are. He proudly owns He knitted you in your mama's belly with unique DNA. He claims that. That's all God. And why? He designed us with all of these factors to be holy space builders. Lawyer, janitor, maybe you're retired. Doctor, receptionist, councilman, housewife, budget director, paper pusher, finance director, customer service supervisor, general handyman, mother, father, husband, wife, and I suspect, you can't say it out loud hardly, but even Michigan fans. I don't know how that's possible, but it's a Ohio State guy. Our job descriptions vary in this room, but our careers are all identical. We are here to bring glory to God and proclaim every square inch of this planet as reclaimed holy space, no matter what you do. So you already have a ministry. You've already been handcrafted for it. You've been uniquely made for it. Listen, you, you can't minister the way I minister, and I can't minister the way you minister. God didn't want that. God doesn't want me to copy Alan. My church might want me to copy Alan. God wants me to be me. He wants me to be redeeming, holy me, fully rehumanized me, and just be me. And he wants you to be just you, the way he made you. He's got a ministry position for you. So I don't care if you spend hours every day in a high-powered 
corporate office or minutes every day at a bus stop waiting for your kids to get off. You've been called to be a temple wherever you sit and make every inch of the earth holy. So I want to go back to that painting, the one we started with. God did not make you as an image bearer to hang you on the wall somewhere or sit you in a pew at a church somewhere. He made you to reflect the eternal artist everywhere. The painting, do you know the name of the painting that I have it up there? I can't remember if I put it on there or not. Anybody see it? It's a, it's a good guess, but no, it's not the Mona Lisa. It's, not, it's about similar, similar size. It's Salvatore Mundi. Salvatore is Savior, and Mundi is world. They restored a painting, and they were able to find out who the artist was. And I think that's priceless. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ron, for uh, giving us so much to chew on. I know that's a uh, blessing of having these uh, videotaped and then posted is that we can go back and watch it again. I know I need to because there's a lot there. So thank you so much for kicking off our 2020 summer series in such a, an, an outstanding way. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I think you actually had one more slide there, Ron. If I recall, you went over it, but as in covered it. Well, oh, that one, maybe that was something. Okay. So, uh, once again, thank you all for being here. and a great, great turnout tonight, actually. Uh, we had as many people here tonight as we did on Sunday. So, that's counting the folks in this room. And then we do have one kids' class tonight, and the teens are meeting as well. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody on Sunday. Uh, just one other reminder, next week we will have uh, as our guest speaker from Montgomery, Alabama, Buddy Bell, who is the preaching minister for the Landmark Church. Some of you know Buddy and Stephanie. I believe Stephanie is going to be here as well. And they may uh, be sharing some time together uh, during the message time. So we hope that you'll come back next week. And uh, as we're beginning to come back out more and do these kinds of things, I hope that you're feeling safe, that you're feeling, hey, this is good. This is uh, helpful. This is healthy uh, to be out and to be with people. Again, folks, we are making your own decisions, but uh, we're glad that you're here. And we hope you can encourage others as they are uh, coming outside the war too. So, uh, with that, we will close for tonight. If you are watching online and you have any questions or you'd like to contact men in church, here's the contact information you see on the screen. And you can always go back to that. We'd love to get an email from you or a phone call or a text and to help you with your walk with the Lord as, as Ron talked about tonight. That God wants to get you not just saved, but he wants to, he saves you so that he can get you to do the work that he created you uh, to do. And with that, we will close. Thank you for your attention this evening for being with us.